The nations rage against the Lord and reject his rule and dominion over them. We see that in politics, in the rulers. It's not simply in the people, but the rulers themselves. Recently, our president decided that the White House will not defend the Defense of Marriage Act in the courts of law. Our Congress has determined that we shall define marriage as that between a man and a woman. That reflects our cultural history for centuries. It reflects the, the standard under, uh, understanding of what marriage means. And yet, our president recently has determined that it is no longer constitutional to defend that thereby opening the way for the United States to recognize same-sex couples as married. Why do the nations rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? The psalmist speaks of the plots and the conspiracies, the many ways in which people conspire against the Lord's dominion over them, and the way they try to throw off God's dominion and live for themselves, live as they see fit without reference to God and His laws and His dominion. How many folks do we know who live for themselves, who care not for others, who do not wish to submit themselves to God's law, but do everything they can to explain it away, to refuse to accept what God has to say? This rebellion is through and through in every segment of society. But the psalmist reminds us that this rebellion, however universal it might be, however determined and focused it might be, however pointed the rulers are in trying to make the conspiracy hold true, it nonetheless is futile and in vain. In fact, God, as He looks down from the heavens above, sees all that's going on, and he laughs. He's amused by it. You've got to be kidding me. The Lord himself, and, and here the psalmist uh, emphasizes the glory and majesty of God by saying he is the one who sits in the heavens. And here are the nations here on earth. And they try to throw off God's rule and dominion. God doesn't need an army to challenge them. He doesn't need to make arrangements to fight against them. By the mere breath of his mouth, he can dismiss them. They are nothing to him. And so the rebellion against his rule is futile. How often have we seen people trying to attack the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, to persecute the people of God from one generation to the next, from one community to the next, trying to drive out and wipe out the name of Christ? How successful have they been? The church continues to expand across the nations of the earth. The gates of hell shall not prevail against Christ's church. And so God sits in the heavens and laughs at these futile attempts. The psalmist says, why do they do these things? It's a puzzle. It makes no sense. When people engage in these kinds of things, their argumentation is foolish. It simply makes no sense. It's against their own best interests. But they continue to assert their own will. Well, God in the heavens laughs, and then He uh, faces their uh, rebellion with His own set determination, I have installed my king on my holy hill, Zion. In spite of what the people say, God does not sit back and try to listen and hear what they have to say. He responds by asserting the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I have established my King on my holy hill. And so Christ is set before the nations of the earth as the one who is the legitimate Lord and King over all. And certainly here is where the hostility of the nations is focused. It's on Jesus. We see that in this crucifixion as the, as the rulers of the people gather together against Christ and try to destroy Him, accusing Him of blasphemy and so forth. Uh, the rulers of the earth are hostile to Jesus Himself. That is where the focus comes. I was watching an interview of the Presbyterian pastor from New York City, Tim Keller, very 
popular, influential uh, writer and pastor who is being interviewed on the Morning Joe program on MSNBC. And uh, they were asking him about the publication of his book, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Keller, <laughs> Cross, uh, Cross King or something to that effect. In any case, it's a story, it's an account of the life of Jesus that Tim Keller writes based on the Gospel of Mark. And the, the panel of journalists who are sitting there and asking him, begin to question him, why do we need another book about Jesus? I mean, he's been around for 2,000 years. Uh, did they learn about him in the Gospels themselves? Why do you need to write another book about him? Now, Tim Keller began to give an explanation. I, I, I think it could have been advanced if he had said that today there are continual rewritings of who Jesus is. Men continually distort the true nature of Jesus and what he came to accomplish, who he was and what he came to accomplish in this world. And so it is necessary to go back to the original documents and explain from them clearly, persuasively, who this Jesus is, and to refute all the false notions that are circulating about. That Jesus is just a man like the rest of us. He's just another Joe, another morning Joe. He's just another guy who uh, gets up in the morning and works. Jesus is more than that. And so there is a need to continually impress upon our culture today just who Jesus was. And amazingly, as Dr. Keller spoke to these uh, journalists, he made the point that Jesus himself claimed to be God. And he then went on and performed various miracles and engaged in acts of compassion. And so he said, Jesus makes the claim to be God, and yet he does the works like a, a Mother Teresa. He has great compassion on others. And how is it that we can put these two together? He's God, and yet he's a miracle worker, kind of like Mother Teresa, kind and gracious to his enemies. How do we put these together and rationalize that? All of a sudden, this panel of journalists were stunned and quiet, because suddenly they're confronted with just who this Jesus is. He is God, and you can't explain him in any other way. And so therefore they had, for a moment, to see this is not somebody that just lightly dismiss or simply flippantly say, oh, he's off in the past, his history, his time, we don't need to discuss him anymore. The psalmist points us to Jesus, the glorious king who is enthroned in the heavens above. And the son is the one who accepts the father's decree and engages himself to take on that dominion. The Father says, I will give you the nations as your inheritance. It's not that he has to go out and win the nations. They are already his possession because God the Father owns the heavens and the earth. The nations are not in independent rebellion living in the world all to themselves. And God has to sit back and try to persuade some to come onto his side. They are in his world. God himself has created them. Their puny act of rebellion is done in the strength that God Himself provides. So, the natural man in his rebellion against God has to do so in the context of God's own dominion over him. In the context of God's sovereign decree over all of history. And the Son declares that the nations are His inheritance. He will rule them. Now, we are rather struck, are we not, with the language of the psalm, that He will rule them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like pots of clay. Who is this Lord? Who is this King that acts in such a sovereign, powerful way? The modern mindset is Jesus is the meek and lowly a uh, lamb of God who has lambs in his arms and is gentle and kind. And he, he, he's all that. But he's also the Lord and King over all who faces the rebellion of the wicked with a stern decree. And by the breath of his mouth, by his word, that rod of iron, he subdues the nations to himself and will judge all mankind by that word. 
And so he is one with whom the nation need to come into account. Uh, incidentally, the description here might confuse you of Jesus or as the Son of God being the, the one who is begotten by the Father. This day you have become my Son. Does that mean that uh, God was one person then he added a second person <laughs> along the way? Or does that mean that Jesus uh, at, at some point takes on the divine nature in himself as he makes progress in his religious life? Not the case. Jesus is the eternal Son of God, ever dwelling in the presence of the Father. The description here in the second psalm is not so much of His eternal generation, the fact that He is ever the Son to the Father, always in relationship to the Father as a Son. The description here is more official. As He ascends to heaven and sits on the throne of God, He then takes up an office as God's adopted Son who rules over the heavens and the earth as the messianic king. It is a redemptive historical way of describing his ascension to office and rule over all things. He always is the eternal Son of God. But in history and time, he takes on our humanity, becomes a man, goes to the cross, dies and rises from the dead, ascends into the heavens as the God-man, our representative, our mediator, our king, and rules over us. And there, he is declared with power to be the Son of God by the Spirit of Holiness. In the conclusion of the psalm, the psalmist addresses the, the kings of the earth. Interestingly, he doesn't just address people in general. Although he addresses people through their kings, through their rulers. But he recognizes that rulers have significant influence in the world. And they bear a special accountability before this king as to how they conduct their reign. And he addresses them and calls upon them to show allegiance to their king. To bow and submit themselves to the risen, exalted Lord Jesus Christ in their personal lives, but also as civil authorities, as kings, as rulers. He addresses them in that particular capacity. They are subject to the reign of Christ. They are His underlords, subject to His dominion, and responsible to conduct themselves in ways that honor and please Him. And should they fail to do that, then He reigns in heaven and executes His judgments on the wicked. Sometimes, swiftly so. I wonder if Hosni Mubarak of Egypt, at the beginning of this year, felt that his rule was in jeopardy, or that he would, within a couple of months, be driven out of power. I rather suspect that that was a surprise to him. The Lord sits in the heavens and he exercises historic judges on the earth. And he rules for the glory of God. And so here we see the psalmist addresses the kings of the earth and calls upon them to submit themselves to the Lord, to kiss the Son, to serve Him with fear, be joyful in that worship. It's a call to repentance, to faith, to service to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he concludes by showing that God's blessing is on those who take refuge in the Lord. God's blessing rests on those who follow Him and serve Him. The psalmist does not give us a, a, a psalm that is simply about something that's up there in the stars, up there in the sky, in the sweet by and by, with no influence on earth, or the things that occur on earth. We need to guard ourselves from a rather Gnostic view of the world where spiritual things occur up there in the heavens and really don't have an impact on life in this world. We can live independently in this world of fact, in this world of logic and reason and science, and then worry about that other world some other time. That's a place for mystery, a place for mythology, a place for stories, 
a place for faith, but it never really impacts itself on my day-to-day -day living or my responsibilities before the Lord in heaven. The psalmist will have none of that. Faith in Jesus Christ is not simply something reserved for the heavenly realms or for some mystical experience. It must work itself out in our lives and call upon us to yield our lives in obedience to Him. In all of life, all is subject to Him. We will serve Him willingly, gladly, and freely by the grace of His Spirit for the glory of His name. Or we will be compelled. And if we continue to resist, then His judgments will come and find us. Whether at the end of life, when we pass from this life and enter into His presence, or in a life that is cut short. Jesus rules over all, and has dominion over the heavens and the earth. And these two Psalms, Psalm 1 and 2, speak of the same one. He is the one in the first Psalm who meditates on the law of God and delights in that law and is fruitful in all of his endeavors for us. He acts on our behalf. He is also the one of whom the law speaks, the one who is entrusted with dominion over the heavens and the earth, who rules in the light of that law to the glory of God. He advances that law through his work on the cross by bringing repentance and faith to those who are his. These two psalms stand before us like the pillars in the temple long ago in the entryway into that place of holiness. They lead us into the presence of God, the glory of this one who sits in the heavens, the one whom we must worship with all of our lives, all that we are, and all that we have. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the truths of your word and for the clarity with which they come and address us in our culture today. We pray for those who are in authority over us. We thank you for them. We thank you for uh, your provision for them, your grace and your mercies. We thank you for uh, our particular country and the blessings that we have here. But we pray that each would understand their calling before you and that rather than advancing the cause of wickedness and sin, they would see their responsibility to advance the cause of righteousness, of holiness. We pray for your blessing on uh, our leaders. We pray that you would guide them in their steps and lead them in the paths of righteousness. For we ask it in Jesus' name.